Good evening. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you here to the Quadrangle Club and most specifically to the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. I'm Steve Edwards. I'm Deputy Director of Programming here at the Institute, and I'm especially delighted to welcome uh, new colleagues and old colleagues, new friends and old, given my long years at WBEZ for this particular event tonight. Um, for those of you who haven't been to an Institute of Politics event, I should point out that we just launched in January. Our purpose really is to enrich the political discourse in this country and in this city, and also to inspire in young people a passion for public life and political service. And we can't think of a better way to do that than with tonight's event, focusing on the Constitution. We can't think of a better way to do that than with these partners at WBEZ, which also share that mission in so many respects as well. So I want to be sure to thank my good friends at 91.5 FM, and to Vanessa Harris, and Don Hall, and Jesse Trevino, and the rest of the crew for helping make this possible tonight. I also want to point out that this is the second of nine events that we have going on this week alone. So for those of you who haven't <coughs> taken part of anything that the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics has to offer, we have plenty more for you just in the next few days. At noon tomorrow at the law school, Cass Sunstein will be in talking about Simpler, the future of government. We'll also have an event on Wednesday with the CEO, executive chairman actually, of Google, Eric Schmidt. He will be in talking about his latest book and the impact of technology on politics and government. And on Thursday, back in this room, a conversation with some of the top members of the Obama administration reflecting on life inside the White House. Not so much a conversation about politics and policy, but really what it's like to be inside the bubble, as it were. That conversation will be moderated by Ken Walsh of US News and World Report, and will also feature White House speechwriter, former White House speechwriter John Favreau, who's currently a fellow. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our conversation tonight uh, with my good friend Peter Sagel, who you will see uh, in just one of these clips the links to which he went to try and bring the Constitution alive to you. What you won't see uh, are the outtakes, I'm told, of, of Peter bow hunting with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, tubing and bungee and jumping. Let me say, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg is after you, you better... <laughs> That's how she plays. It's like the most dangerous game. She that's just, right. That's right. You will not see that. You will see, She though. did give me a head start, for which I'm grateful. <laughs> you, will see, uh, you will see Peter um, uh, with full-on firefighting gear um, doing everything humanly possible to save someone's life. I'm not sure whose, but you will see that coming up. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce um, our focus tonight. Peter Segel, of course, the longtime host since 1998, in fact, uh, and the award-winning Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, one of the most popular shows in all of public media. And Todd Henderson, who is one of the distinguished professors at the law school and um, somebody that we chose just specifically for this event because of the fact that he is uh, uh, somebody who is renowned not only for his scholarship but also his teaching abilities. He's a graduate of Princeton undergraduate and the University of Chicago Law School. So please join me in welcoming Peter Sagel and Todd Henderson for Constitution USA. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Steve, for that uh, introduction, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I should say, just get this out of the way at the beginning, uh, thanks also to WBEZ. I'm a longtime listener, but uh, I call this problem in my, for my students free riding. I'm not a member, uh, but I promise that I will remedy that. Yes, I know, I know, but I'm just being honest. I'm getting it out there so that we, yeah. <laughs> I, I will make amends. I will make amends. This has brought to the fore the necessity and importance of public. So I, I, I promise to, to remedy that. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Peter and commend him on this uh, series. I've just spent the last four hours watching uh, the four episodes. And it is a great project. It's uh, very well done. It's informative and taking on what is for lawyers, something that I think is uh, a crucial part of public policy that's missing. That is a real awareness of the Constitution. So uh, I, c I commend it to you all. Episode 2 airs tomorrow night on your uh, PBS station. I think the first thing I was interested in when they asked me to do this event, they said, Peter Sagel, the Constitution, and I sort of paused for a second. Uh, you know, if Alex Trebek were doing a 
documentary about the Catholic Church, I would think, well, that's an interesting person and an interesting subject, but they don't really go together so much. So why did you take this project on? What was the what was in your head about choosing uh, choosing the Constitution? No, you don't pledge at all? <laughs> Not ever? No. Um, well, the short, the very short version is they asked me. Uh, but the longer and more hopefully interesting version, let me do this so I don't have to lean forward. The more interesting version, I hope, is that um, you are incorrect, sir, in that there is no connection between what I do for a living at Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and this because... Let's say I um, make fun of the president. Well, the president is a constitutional officer. Uh, so is, that's not funny, it's true. <laughs> not everything I say is funny. You will know I mean it to be funny when I waggle my eyebrows. <laughs> the, you know, like, you know, we make fun of, uh, of, of you know, we, we'll do a story about, uh, you know, Congress and their dysfunction. Well, that's a constitutional issue. And I, you know, our show does a lot more than politics. We do politics and people sticking animals down their pants to smuggle them through customs. But we do some politics. And you can't spend as much time thinking or even making jokes about politics without getting interested in, for lack of a more interesting word, civics, how this country is supposed to work. In fact, you could argue that I make my living from the failures of our country to function correctly. And thus, I became interested over the years in how it is supposed to function. So this documentary, the four hours that you see and the many, many hours I spent on the road making it, was a chance for me to actually explore in a serious way all this stuff that I make jokes about the rest of my time. Did you have, you know, when you were coming at it, I, I will say as a viewer, it is remarkably balanced. The points of view in particular cases and... Uh, one of the features of this, uh, something you won't see here, is interviewing law professors. Uh, the sort of mix of professors that you chose were, yeah. you know, it's you don't want to characterize people, but it was a good mix of One of the things of we found out is that all the law professors have really strong feelings about all the other law professors. <laughs> so every time I'd say to one law, pro law professor X that I talked to law professor Y, the reaction was almost always, oh, you talked to him? <laughs> But it didn't, Do it, any of you like each other? It's really strange. It, it's a little bit like uh, mid, like middle school, but um, you, it didn't seem like you had a point of view about the Constitution in the. It's, you know, if we, you look. We, well, what we didn't have was we didn't have one of the traditional points of views, i.e., um, liberal or conservative. Yeah. Which I believe in our country has become as the equivalent in terms of both intensity and meaninglessness as star-bellied and plain-bellied sneeches <laughs> in that you just hate each other uh, without actually knowing why. And what we really wanted to do was we wanted to get beyond that debate and discover and talk about things that make the debate possible because that's really what we were interested in because the Constitution isn't there to settle arguments. It's not the, you know, in, in other words, the Constitution doesn't exist so that I could sit here and say, well, I have the right to do X. And you say, no, you don't. And I say, yes, I do. It's in the Constitution. I win. That's not what the Constitution is meant to do. It's meant to allow us to argue that point without killing each other. And one of the things that Akhil Ridamar, uh, one of the law professors who you may or may not see in one of the clips that we talked to says, is, is the Constitution is such an enormous thing, he calls it the hinge of human history, because more or less prior to the US Constitution, arguments were settled by killing each other. After the US Constitution, arguments became more or less settled by democratic action. But the arguments continued. And you know, people talk about the dysfunction of our constitutional system, and they talk about how we're constantly at each other's throats, and they talk about how the, you know, Everybody hates everybody else. I said, well, that's, um, it's, it's bad, yeah, but if you want to see what, what like human politics was like before the U.S. Constitution and modern democracy, watch Game of Thrones. Real life, real medieval, you know, going back to the dawn of history was just like that, except with less nudity. <laughs> How did you pick the professors? You know, you mentioned Akhil Amar. You also interviewed Rick Garnett at Notre Dame and uh, Jody Freeman, who I think is at Harvard now. Yeah. Uh, well, how, what, basically, what I mean, you know, we just wanted somebody, because there are these points of view. So, for example, we wanted to kill Rita Mark because he wrote a book called uh, the, Const the, US Const the American Constitution of Biography. I mean, the man knows every word of the Constitution by heart, 
which isn't that hard to do. There's only 4,400 of them. However, he also knows who wrote that word, what words they thought of to, th they thought of to use before they ended up using that word. They know what everybody, he knows what everybody, you know, he's just astonishingly um, knowledgeable man about the Constitution itself. The other experts we brought in, we really wanted to find the best people to represent particular points of view. Um, so for example, uh, we were talking about, in the first episode, which aired last week, federalism uh, and the related issue of the expansion over the course of the 20th century of federal power using, in many cases, the Commerce Clause and a, a broad reading of the Commerce Clause. Well, we talked to a guy named Randy Barnett. Who graduate of our law school. Graduate of your law school, former um, prosecutor here in Chicago who went to the law school here and is now a really well-known libertarian slash conservative law professor who was, among many other things, the primary architect of the legal challenge to Obamacare that went to the Supreme Court. He believes that the federal government has vastly over, overextended its constitutional limits on what it can do. Uh, and so if you want somebody to articulate that, get that guy. And we were able in many cases to get that guy. I will say that we interviewed him on the day after the Obamacare decision came down. He looked a little surly, I could see. Well, it was actually kind of funny. He, we, we brought him to a barn out in this, like, this <laughs> model farm about 50 miles west of here. And um, he was really nice, actually. He, was, he really appreciated the chance, like, oh, PBS is going to let me exp you know, exp exposit, I guess. Is that a verb? My conservative views, that's awesome. And he was great. And then we went to have lunch. And he was so mad. <laughs> he said things about John Roberts that I hope John Roberts <laughs> never hears about. I, I will report that he told me he, he viewed the first episode and he was, he was delighted with his treatment. He said so. The, I was delighted the, that he was the delighted. the overall approach. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the fact that the people who we interviewed felt that they were given a chance to express their actual views fairly. That was our point. Yeah, and I think also the choice of your vignettes, the issues that you took on, uh, some of them, uh, that approach of uh, which ones you chose also seemed to have this balanced approach. So, for instance, you talked about the, uh, the, uh, the monks of St. Joseph's Abbey. Yes. Tell us about those guys. And well, this what is that... actually kind of interesting. You mentioned, we were talking, I guess, back there, I guess I won't say backstage, and um, one of the things you said was that at Yale, where Akil teaches, they require a constitutional law that every law student take that, but they don't require property law. And here at the University of Chicago Law School, they require property law, but they don't require constitutional law. And he says, there's the two institutions, right? Because here at the University of Chicago Law School, property is the root of everything. And, um... <laughs> See, everything you say is funny. Apparently. Not a law student, I think. <laughs> and in fact, we, we, we went to, to the monks be, because it's an important property law case. There are people, uh, I think the Institute, I, want, I don't remember their name. Institute of Justice. Thank you, the Institute of Justice, who are trying to revive the idea of property rights as being the preeminent right. And when you hear that, you think, uh, oh, they just don't want to be taxed. I get it. But that's not it at all. They believe that the right to have your stuff and keep the government from taking your stuff is a preeminent right, up there with the right to free speech, up there with the right not to be seized and held in prison, uh, which you might call bodily uh, freedom. And they have a point. They, uh, among other things, they were behind the Kilo versus New London challenge that failed but led to a lot of reforms in eminent domain, and we had an amazing day, day there, which I'll tell you about if you're interested. But there are these monks and like some monks make whiskey and some monks make beer and some monks make cheese, these monks make caskets, plain wooden caskets that they initially started making just to bury their own monks on the grounds of their you know, monastery there north of Lake Posture Train. But people liked their caskets. They're plain, simple. They have that kind of, I don't know what you call it, um, uh, like you know, shaker look to them. And people wanted to buy them. One of the reasons they wanted to buy them is that if you go to a funeral home in Louisiana, they charge you a lot of money for these big caskets, which you're about to bury in the ground and never see again. So the idea of inexpensive but well-made and dignified pine caskets was great. 
And they were making their caskets and selling them when the state of Louisiana told them they couldn't. Why can't you, why can't they sell their caskets? Because in the state of Louisiana, there is a law that says in order to sell a casket, you have to be a licensed funeral director. And that means you have to have like an embalming lab, you have to have certification on how to embalm people, you have to have all these facilities appropriate to a funeral home in order to sell a casket, even though they weren't burying people, they were just selling caskets. And the Institute of Justice brought a, um, a claim, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, under the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, which as you remember, was signed into law after the Civil War by the radical Republicans, and it guarantees everyone equal treatment of the law. That has been used in the 20th century, equal protection of the law, excuse me. And that has been used in the 20th century to do, among many other things, uh, and desegregation uh, and other important civil rights. However, these guys, the Institute of Justice, were like equal protection of the laws means equal protection to earn a trade. There's no way under the 14th Amendment that funeral directors can sell caskets and these guys can't. And it turns out the only reason they have this law is because the funeral directors lobby in Louisiana donates a lot of money to politicians and they like having the monopoly. And it was struck down. And if that, in a federal court, and if this becomes a precedent, all kinds of things will change in this country. Yeah, it's interesting because the typical uh, move that we think of about uh, majorities oppressing minorities is when the a large group of people in a particular jurisdiction doesn't like one particular group. They don't like their skin color, they don't like their sexual orientation, they don't like some feature about them, and so 50% plus one of the people team up and they want to oppress the other people. These cases are a little different because the theory here isn't that 50% of the people in Louisiana really want to buy their caskets from funeral directors. It's that a few really uh, people with very powerful interests uh, go to the legislatures and say, most people don't care about this. We'll give right. you a lot of money to rule our way. Right. So it's a, it's a kind of majority oppression by minority that works through the legislative process as opposed to the typical. A more uh, a sort of uh, uh, another example, which is more in the classic sense of a majority teaming up with a minority is the basis for our first clip we're going to show, which is uh, about gay marriage. Coming plaintiffs in a federal case is a pretty big deal. That must have been a difficult decision to well, go ahead with. It's been incredibly different to take on a public role right. versus just privately suffer. Right. And that's what it's been like for, for many, many years. Since 2004, we've just sort of privately suffered, feeling like we'll never get to be like other people. Yeah. But what about the idea that these guys are like, hey, this is my state. We had an election. I voted my conscience. My side won. And now you're going to take away? the result? I mean, isn't that undemocratic? What about their rights as voters, as citizens of California? Well, we don't believe that they had the right to take away our rights. We didn't think that the voters should have even voted on the issue. If you can vote in anything you want if enough of you want to. Right. That doesn't make you right. It just means there were more of you. Right. So if you're a minority right. and you're never going to be the majority, you will never win your rights. This is that's why there's a constitution. So I imagine you guys have had occasion to read the constitution. Have you read the preamble? Yes. We the people? Yes. What do you think of when you read that? Um, oddly enough, I'm, I, because I've been gay my entire adult life, yeah. I have had a hard time feeling like it includes me. Really? Yeah. So you're, like, you're like, we the people, and you're like, nah, um, We the people, and, and then parentheses, I wish I were part of this. I aspire to be we the people, part of the we. Yeah. And, and for me, this, this fight, for marriage equality is is like entry into we and and without it I don't believe I belong I mean I'm not I don't the Constitution and we've been reading it doesn't say anything about marriage mm -hmm. gay straight or otherwise mm -hmm. so how can you say that there is a constitutional right to do something you want to do just because you want to do it equal protection it's about equal protection, right. because whether it's marriage or something else, we right. should have the, the same right to you to drink out of a water fountain, right. to drive a car, right. and to marry each other than anybody else does. And so that's what we're really, really fighting for, and that's what our case is based on. So this is a great example um, of the possibility of courts acting in, you know, especially the Supreme Court, who's now hearing the gay marriage cases, two of them which are pending before them, of acting in a counter-majoritarian fashion. And oftentimes, as someone who's read a little bit about the Supreme Court, uh, some of the Supreme Court's best moments are when it's acting counter to the majority, protecting minorities from majority oppression. 
But one thing that occurs to me in watching this, uh, today Minnesota became the 12th state to pass a law uh, legalizing uh, gay marriage, and I assume the governor will sign it, that he said he will. Uh, and there is a legislative process that's happening in many states. We had Ruth Bader Ginsburg visiting us at the law school this weekend, and she was very pointed about Roe versus Wade in saying she thinks it was a mistake. She thinks that there was a legislative groundswell moving in the, in the states that was going to make the issue basically go away uh, in, uh, in a few years, and instead by taking it and making it a constitutional issue and enshrining it in the Constitution, it kind of did, maybe not Game of Thrones, but if you've been to some abortion protests, it's, it's got that flavor to it. So I'm wondering what you think now coming away from this, this battle of courts versus legislatures and when, when it makes sense to take something like gay marriage and put it into the Constitution uh, and when it makes sense to have it be sort of more the laboratories of democracy you talked about. That's a very good question. I, I just want to say a little bit about that clip. The, the woman on the left, from your point of view, with the glasses is named Chris Perry. The woman to her right is Sandy Steer, her partner of many years who she wants to marry. Chris Perry is the Perry in Hollingsworth v. Perry, which is one of the cases of the Supreme Court. As you know, what happened was California Supreme Court said, hey, our Constitution guarantees a right to get to same-sex marriage. It was put up to a vote, Proposition 8, by like 52%, the people of California voted to amend the Constitution, excuse me, to change it to exclude same-sex couples from marriage. Uh, there was a federal lawsuit signed, a federal lawsuit filed uh, with Chris Perry and her partner is one of the two pairs of plaintiffs. The other one was a male couple from Southern California. Uh, they won in federal court. That was appealed, now it's in front of the Supreme Court. Um, there's, there's, there's so many different facets to that question. When should the Supreme Court step in and guarantee a right, particularly to protect a minority? When is it appropriate, when it is not appropriate? One of the things that I have come to understand, and again, this is something that Akhil Reed Amar uh, suggested, and I didn't believe him at first, but thinking about it, I think he's right. In those cases where we think of the Supreme Court imposing a right, as the opponents of whatever decision it may be, on the people, say Brown v. Board, say um, Loving v. Virginia, which uh, made uh, miscegenation laws illegal, um, you know, mixed race marriages made them legal. Um, say Griswold v. Connecticut, the contraceptive case that established a right to privacy. You could say, and people have said, that all of those cases imposed a right, imposed desegregation on the South, imposed mixed race marriages on the South again, on people who weren't ready for it. But in fact, each of those cases came at a time where the country was ready to be forced to do it. Not everybody was, as anybody who's a history of the civil rights movement. I went to Little Rock and talked to, to um, Minnie Jean Brown, who was one of the Little Rock Nine. She, she will tell you that Little Rock wasn't ready for desegregation. But think about what would have happened if by some bizarre freak chance, in 1896, the Supreme Court had ruled the other way in Plessy v. Ferguson if they had said, you know what, 14th Amendment clearly guarantees the equal protection of the laws. It clearly makes separate rail cars for blacks and whites unconstitutional. So everybody, deseg segregation is now illegal in 1896 in this profoundly at that time racist country. What would have happened? And what would have happened obviously is people would have marched in the Supreme Court with pitchforks. It would have been a, a, a tremendous social upheaval. And in fact, I think what Akhil said is that the Supreme Court, even in these contentious cases, is responding to the people's will, as understood not just by polling, but also by legislative action, by social attitudes, even by things like, are there prominent you know, cases of these things happening that people accept? I don't know if the movie Guess Who's Coming to Dinner had anything to do with the case Love <laughs> v. Virginia, but I bet it did. I mean, in fact, a lot of the, a lot, uh, th there was this great, great moment in the Supreme Court case, uh, the arguments of Hollingworth v. Perry, in which Justice Scalia, who is apparently opposed to this idea of imposing the right of same-sex marriage, said to uh, Ted Olson, who was arguing on behalf of Chris, um, when, if, if, if same-sex marriage is a constitutional right, when, when did it become part of the Constitution? When was it written in? And the point he was making, which was obvious, is that none of the people who wrote the Constitution or amended it ever thought about same-sex marriage as a constitutional right. And 
Ted Olson answered him in a Jewish way with a question. He answered the question with a question. He said, well, when did desegregation become constitutional? When did a right to privacy be become constitutional? And, and, and the answer is, although Ted Olson didn't say it, and neither did Scalia, when we decided it was there all along. In 1956, the Supreme Court, reacting to the country as a whole in ways that they may not even have admitted, decided that the right to shared public facilities, to desegregation, was there all along. So I think there is something democratic even about Supreme Court cases. In regard to when they should be put into the legislative arena or left to the legislative arena, that is such a hard call. You heard Sandy's argument, why in the world should my rights be subject to someone else's vote? And that is a tough question. When is, because the Constitution, again, doesn't want to solve these issues. It wants to say to you, the American people, our posterity, here's a Congress, here's a President, here's a Supreme Court, solve the issues yourselves. But I think that it's rare in our history, and I would, I would disagree with the Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg. I think it's rare that they have made the wrong decision. It happened unequivocally once when the people amended the Constitution to legislate, and that was prohibition. And that was a real mistake uh, when we took something out of the legislative arena and put it in the constitutional arena. And then we had to take that back X numbers of years later. But I, I don't even think Roe v. Wade was a mistake. I think, I th I think she's bought into an argument that I don't, have, I, I don't give a lot of credibility to. But there you are. Any uh, interesting behind the scenes, things that were left out of the four hours that I saw, uh, and the reason I ask this is one of the most, what the New York Times called, a uh, critic called a beautiful moment, and I agree, I was uh, teary-eyed, was when you were interviewing Matthew Snyder's dad. Yeah. This, Matthew Snyder was a Marine who was killed, and uh, at his funeral, the Westboro Baptist Church protest, and so they use this as a uh, mechanism for setting up uh, the First Amendment issues there. Supreme Court ruled against uh, the uh, father. And the questions that you were asking him were the kinds of questions that, as a law professor, I would ask my students. But I'm, I'm talking to 20-year-old English majors from Williams College who are, you know, have to listen to me. Here you're sitting across from a father of a dead Marine and asking him what I thought were really tough, great, but very tough questions. Uh, and I just wonder if anybody... Yeah, I mean, not Matthew Snyder's dad, but did anybody, you know, get up and walk out or take a swing at you? Or, no, I mean, no, was... no. I mean, really, uh, you know, my job was to find out what people thought. And sometimes to, to I mean, I also asked, as you saw Chris and Sandy, some yeah. pointed questions. In fact, uh, I, the word back from the editing room was that I was me too mean to them. I'm sorry. I don't think it comes, I don't, no, it, no, the no. viewers won't see it no, that no. way. Uh, he's an interesting case. I, I, one of the fun things, sort of behind the scenes, one of the fun things, just to set the scene, because we haven't seen the scene, uh, about five or six years ago, Al Snyder's son, Matthew Snyder, was killed in Iraq. And he was brought home for burial. And this was around the time that the, our, our friends at the Westboro Baptist Church decided that it would be really fun to picket the funerals of dead soldiers. I mean, the AIDS crisis had abated. They couldn't get press doing that anymore, protesting those funerals. So they decided to protest the funerals of soldiers saying that the soldiers were killed because God, America tolerates homosexuality. They have, just parenthetical, more of an obsession with homosexual sex than many homosexuals do, <laughs> be that as it may. And what happened was is, so Snyder, of course, is devastated. His 21-year-old son, who he adores, has been killed. He's burying him. And he didn't even actually see the protests himself. He was sitting and watching the coverage of these horrible, horrible people showing up these signs and shouting outside the funeral home. And he got very upset, and he sued them under a Maryland law for emotional distress, and he won, and he won big, a couple million dollars. And um, that went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, eight to one, reversed the ruling. And they basically, the, the, I mean, I haven't read the ruling, and I probably wouldn't understand it if I did, but the gist of it is you can't sue somebody successfully for speaking, even if the speech is vile and horrible and incredibly offensive. Um, and you can't was, get more offensive than Nazis in Skokie. Can you? Well, I don't know. I mean, this is pretty bad. I mean, they chose Skokie on purpose. Yes, I know. They cho Although yeah. that's a weird story, but we can, we can, okay. we can, we can go For off later. on that if you want to. They wanted to march over there, and they couldn't get a permit. 
Did you know that? I didn't. They, 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 these, these, the, the, the Nazis in the famous 1978 Skokie March were just these homegrown Chicago guys. Illinois Nazis are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the fun part was um, whenever we did these interviews, there was always a moment when they needed footage of me from a distance talking to the interview subject doing what are called, uh, well, sometimes we do what are called naughties, which whenever you see me going like, <laughs> that's a naughty. And a naughty is there so that when they're editing the conversation and they need to splice the other person's speech together, instead of having a shot of his face going yeah. as he speaks, they sh cut to me going, <laughs> and they can cut back to him and he finishes his sentence. And the other thing they do is they do these long shots of us like walking down the street chatting, and then you can sort of put in voice over it, like, like that's what we're talking about. So I had this great opportunity to talk to all of these people walking up and down the street and get off topic, right? And, I'd, and Al Snyder, who is very serious in this, was actually a really nice guy. Al Snyder, his secret, which is not going to be a secret because he's publishing a memoir, he himself is gay, which is why he's no longer married to uh, his, his son's mother. Hmm. And he during that period was in the midst of his long, a long, happy relationship with another man. And um, he told me a story as we're walking down the street that um, at one point during this case, which made big news at the time, a news crew wanted to come and interview him at, the, uh, at his home, which he shared with this other man. And he says he really didn't want a, his sexuality to get out because he was afraid that if it did, it would be, be about a, a gay man being offended at some homophobes, which he thought was not the point, and it's not. But he told me the story that um, he wanted to, um, so this news crew was there, and he said, I have some video of my son to show you. And he turned on the TV and the video player, and it turns out that his partner had been watching some gay porn. <laughs> so he's standing there, and... Um, and he turns it on, and so sort of all of a sudden, it's like, and, and there was sort of this moment of, <laughs> so um, I don't know if that'll be in the memoir. So yeah, um, wasn't in the version no, I saw. No, no. So what what is success for you for this project? Because I I got the sense that you want Americans to understand better this constitution they have, not. Not all Americans are like uh, law professors where they carry uh, these around with them. Um, but it seems Ooh, like... Oh, you got the leather-bound one. That's awesome. I do, courtesy of the Cato Institute. Um, <laughs> so uh, it seems like you're up against a pretty big battle. I looked at some polling data before I came yeah. over. Uh, I don't know if you knew, but uh, the Marxist... Uh, aphorism from each according to his ability to each is according to his needs is in the Constitution or so four out of ten of you apparently believe uh, there's a right to the f to uh, education in the First Amendment shared by six out of ten of you so it seems like there's remarkable ignorance about the Constitution yes. uh, even journalists um, writing about the Constitution uh, with all due respect always get it wrong so uh, oh I'm not a journalist yeah <laughs> So is that your goal, to, to, to make people yeah. more informed? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you know, there are a lot of citations. One we started, there's more people can name the three stooges and the three branches of government. It's Mo, Harry, and the judiciary. <laughs> Larry, excuse me. Mangle my own joke. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's so frustrating that this stuff is so incredibly important and so tied up in every single thing you do today and we'll do tomorrow, and is so important in all the things we argue about in terms of politics and policy and ideology and right and left, and nobody knows anything about it. And part of it is the way it's taught. During this whole process, my seventh grade daughter did her seventh grade civics unit, which we all did, and it is deadly. It's like pictures of George Washington, you know, and then there's, you know, holding the Constitution, and then there's like all these charts it's like, well, here's the, here's the Congress and here's the president and they check each other this way and here's the judiciary and there's an arrow going this way. It's as exciting as going to your corporate office and looking at a hierarchy chart. That's civics as it is taught. And it is not that. It is the 101st Airborne 
escorting nine black kids into Little Rock High in 1957 because the Supreme Court said that they had to desegregate even if the state of Arkansas did not want to do that. An amazing story. They reunite in the in the, yeah. in the movie. They reunite a, a soldier who uh, escorted uh, Minnie Jean uh, into class. Right. And you know, for people like me who I wasn't alive then, and that part of history is, I, I mean, I know about it because I've read some books, but I don't think you really appreciate it until you see the videos and hear the testimonials. Right. And it's a very powerful part right. of the. It, and it's not. And some of the stuff isn't that overtly dramatic, but. You know, for example, we went to Tyler, Texas and talked to the Lopez family. Who are the Lopez family? The Lopez family are a big family, many of them born in Mexico and brought here uh, undocumented as children in the 1970s. And at the end of the 1970s, uh, I, I don't know if it was the state of Texas or the local district, passed a law saying that if you weren't a citizen, you had to pay $1,000 a year to go to the public schools, K through 12, right? And some activist lawyers thought this was not right, and they looked around for some uh, plaintiffs who'd be willing to come out of the closet, if you will, as undocumented, and be plaintiffs in this case. You needed somebody who had standing. And this family volunteered, meaning that they subjected themselves to possible deportation, because they were basically admitting that they weren't here legally. And they won the case. It was called Plyler v. Doe. Plyler was the head of the school board in Tyler, and Doe was the pseudonym for this family. And they won, and they established that the Constitution guarantees every resident of this country, documented or not, a free public education. And most people have never heard of Plyler v. Doe. I had not heard of Plyler v. Doe. And yet there we were. We went out with the Lopez family. They're all obviously adults now. They all have jobs. They all ha they have huge families of their own, all, of course, you know, U.S. citizens because they were born here. We went to a, f a, a Texas high school football game which was something, <laughs> at their high school, and it was awesome. And so, like, these people are now Americans as much as anybody in this room. They're productive Americans, probably more than everybody in this room, seeing as they're primarily academics here. <laughs> I mean, these guys at least drive trucks of food to the warehouse, so there's something to eat, okay? And, and, this, and they have this wonderful life, and they don't really even know how important they were. They don't know that they changed our constitutional regime just a little bit. And that's how it works, you know? I mean, this Supreme Court decision, which you and I have never heard of, led to these people and thousands of other people having rich, full lives here in America. And that's amazing. So that's, a, that's one that I'm guessing that uh, a sort of issue, a case or controversy, what lawyers would say, a case or controversy that you probably agreed with before you started doing this, and then right. you you found these guys. I would say, yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. We should educate yeah. people, and we should be opening, uh, open to people. Uh, was there a case yes. or controversy or issue where you went in thinking, "Yep, oh, I've been taught to believe X," and then you asked, interviewed, and then you said, "Ah, not X." It was the one I referred to <clears throat> earlier, uh, Kilo versus the City of New London. This was a case in which the city of New London, Connecticut, had this idea. They had just brought in this big corporate headquarters, Pfizer, I believe, convinced them through tax breaks to move in. But the problem was their big new corporate headquarters backed on this old lower middle class neighborhood on this really valuable land near the ocean. And they came up with this idea. Wouldn't it be great if we can get rid of that neighborhood and build a fabulous new retail development, you know, with a health club and condominiums and maybe a Whole Foods, you know. And that way, all the wonderful white-collar employees who are working at Pfizer would have a cool place to stay and live, and it'll be great. And they tried to seize the homes through eminent domain. Eminent domain is what comes out of the Fifth Amendment. Correct. And the Fifth Amendment says that I mean, among the very many guarantees it gives criminal defendants, it says, and, and property sh can't be taken without, let me think, what's the phrase? Do For public use without just compensation. Public use. That's the two words. And... With the help of the Institute of Justice, this property rights organization, they fought back. Some of them did anyway, including a Mrs. Kilo, who gave her name to the case. And they fought back saying public use cannot mean giving it to somebody else for private benefit. The case went to the Supreme Court, and they lost. The Supreme Court decided that economic development can be public use. If it will raise the economic stature of a city, then that counts. It doesn't have to be the classic school or railroad or whatever. Now... When this case came down in 2005, it caused a tremendous amount of upset on the right wing and the far right wing. And he points to me. No, I was pointing. No, no. Oh, I, I was pointing Just to my right. right hand. I see. Okay. You happen to be in my right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Although, since you teach at the University of Chicago Law School, I could make my Odds assumptions. Are, yes. All right. Anyway. <laughs> And I was like, and you know, I will say that I as like, you know, sheltered, you know, member. I was like, yeah, well, if they're upset about it, then it's probably not that bad. <laughs> would be my thinking, right? And you know, there were the cases where people were picketing D- David Souter's house because he wrote the decision, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this whole idea that private property is the preeminent right seemed wrong to me. I would have said the preeminent right is, you know, a free speech, freedom of conscience, a freedom of, you know, you fr- again, freedom of your body that you can't be seized and put in prison for no reason. I would have ranked those higher. But these guys were like, no, private property. The government can't take your private property. Very important. So this is my point of view. Big deal in the right wing, probably not a big deal in real life. Then I go to this vast, empty field, which is all that remains of that vibrant lower middle class neighborhood, old homes going back to the beginning of the century. Because, of course, this private development never happened. People said, this is never going to happen. The money that's being promised ain't going to show up. It's like, it was like, you know, the New London version of Block 37, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Don gets it. And I stood there with a man named Michael Cristofaro. Mrs. Kilo has left town. She wants nothing to do with New London ever again. But Michael Cristofaro, whose parents lived there, stood in the middle of this field of weeds and pointed at the place where the bulldozers bulldozed his parents' home, including the tomato plants that he had promised his father that he'd be able to save, but they wouldn't let him save the tomato plants. And he's standing there with tears in his eyes, saying, why in the world should any government have the right to come and bulldoze your house because they think it's a good idea? that it will somehow make the town better if you're gone. And it was very hard to argue with him that A, the government really should have no right to do it, and it is a terrible thing and even an unconstitutional thing in terms of the idea of protections of liberty to allow a government to do that. So that was a case where I won't say my mind changed because I wasn't really informed enough to have an opinion, but I ended up finding out that the things that I had believed were profoundly wrong. And yeah, and that, it's, a, it's, it's related to the St. Joseph Abbey case in a sense that well, in both of those it. cases, big giant corporations capture the machinery of government and twist it to their own private, you know, companies are going to maximize their bottom line and maximize their profits, and all the better if they can get politicians to help them out by eliminating the competition. One, one, so, of, one of the things that we found, that I found personally, is that when you get into these issues and you really understand what's going on, the traditional definitions of left and right start really to disappear. Down, yeah. Because... If I say to you, are you in favor of government allying with small but powerful economic interests (laughs) to dominate a market or tear apart a community, I don't care whether you're a Tea Partier or a Marxist. You're going to say, no, of course not, you know, and it all depends on how it's framed, the language that's being used, and to tell you the truth, a lot of it depends on who takes what side because we are – just like I did, I'm like, if those, if those right-wing guys, prior to, the, prior to the Tea Party, if those far right-wing guys are against this, then I must be for it. There's really a tribal sense amongst all of us that dominates our arguments more than we would ever admit of saying, who's on which side? How do I pick my side? Who's wearing my uniform? Oh, my uniform, my, my team is up to bat, then I'm up to bat, as opposed to being in the field. I, I couldn't agree more. Um... So uh, I want to end, and then I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, there, I have a, a hundred other questions, but one thing that you talked a little bit about was a constitutional renewal. Yeah. Our constitution is 224, about to be 225 years old. Uh, it is the longest lived of all constitutions ever. The average, my, my colleague Tom Ginsburg has done some work on this, the average life expectancy of a constitution is uh, 10 years. Uh, and so... This is very rare we have this long-lived constitution. And as you, as you note in the piece, Thomas Jefferson thought 20 years was about right. We should rewrite the constitution every 20 years. And you talked about Iceland yes. engaged in their constitutional uh, rewriting uh, as a footnote, something that happened after the, the piece aired. Their attempts at rewriting had failed. The yeah. constitution was rejected that they uh, developed through sort of a wiki uh, model. But so what do you think about constitutional renewal? Do you think we should... Start over, should we make, are there some amendments you have in mind, or do you think we should just stick with the old? I I think, um, I think that, uh, I was trying to think of a funny answer, but I can't think (laughs) of one right now. Um, 
It is true uh, that our Constitution has lasted much longer than many, many others. And I personally have two guesses as to why. A, it's short. There's not a lot in there. One of the things that the Icelandic Constitution is, and I have a copy, it's in Icelandic. I don't know what I'll ever do with it, but it's signed at least. Is there a market on eBay for signed Icelandic <laughs> failed constitutions? It's very long because what happened was is these guys, these citizens after the economic and then political collapse of 2008 that really struck Iceland to the core, they said, our country's clearly not working. If this could have happened, we need to start again. And so what did they do? Well, they did what every committee will do if you give them a chance. They put everything everybody wanted in it. You know, it's, it's so much easier to say, well, I want X and you want Y. I tell you what, we'll put, I, I think Y is okay. It's not my priority. We'll just put X and Y in. Okay, yes. So it, it, everything put in it. Uh, Icelander, Icelanders, I guess, would have a right to this and a right to that and to health care. And there was stuff about protecting the environment, which they care a lot about there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our founding fathers, and they were all men, so I guess that's not sexist, didn't do that. They wrote 4,400 words, most of which is about the machinery of setting up the government and electing the government, a lot of which is about the ratification of the document itself. So take out 1,000 words for that, you got 3,400 words that describe everything. And in addition to it being short, the words they did use were ambiguous. Uh, Congress shall have, the right, shall, shall have the power to pass all laws necessary and proper to carry out its enumerated duties. What the hell does that mean? They didn't know. I think, although... Uh, and your brother agrees with you. Yes, my brother agrees with me. My brother's <laughs> in the documentary, too, talking about something else entirely. But, the, but I think that... I mean, Richard Beeman, who's a great... If, if, if Akil Rita Mar is the great legal scholar of the Constitution, Richard Beeman is the great... Uh, historian of the Constitutional Convention. He, he's like he knew every one of them personally. He can tell you where they all sat, and he did. He says they didn't think it would last, but he also says they didn't want to restrict posterity. They knew on some level that in order for this to work, we here in this imaginable future day of 2013 would have to figure this stuff out for ourselves because we wouldn't let these 18th century guys in wigs and stockings tell us what to do right? Because we'd rebel. We're all children at heart. We're not going to let our father tell us, our founding fathers, what tell us what to do at this age any more than we let our father tell us what to do. And that is why I think it's worked, because they left a lot of stuff up to us. And I'll say one last thing about that is, again, it's about the standard debate. Living constitution versus originalist view. Does the constitution change? Does the constitution stay the same? And my feeling about this is, and apologies to the University of Chicago Law School, because I know this is a hotbed of this kind of thinking, if you think that we should follow the Constitution as it was originally intended, insofar as we can figure that out, using Ouija boards or whatever, uh, then you can argue for that, and there might be a good reason to argue for that. But you can't argue with any real credence that that's what we've done. You can't say that through the 225-year history of the American Republic, we have strictly obeyed the original intent of the constitutional, Constitution's framers, and now we're thinking of changing it, or we just started with the Warren Court or whatever. We've constantly changed our understanding of what it means. We changed what equal protection meant from segregation to desegregation. We changed um, what cruel and unusual punishment meant. We changed everything as we've gone along. So it has been alive. Because, as I keep saying, the only thing that makes the Constitution work is the people alive today, involved in it, engaged in it, and making it work. By itself, all the Constitution does is fade. Yeah, I think you have a line in there, something like, if, we do, if all we do is, you know, if we don't read it, if we don't understand it, if we don't live it, it's just words on paper. It is. It's I just mean, parchment under glass. It's like Mao. He's under glass. He's not really doing anything. And we've got our... We have our law under glass, these, not our despots. But. These people are writing to me now, and they're saying, oh, you know, the Constitution forbids this. The Constitution forbids Obamacare, so we can't have Obamacare. Or the Constitution, on the liberal side, they say the Constitution says that Congress, only Congress have the power to declare war, and our presidents have been running roughshod over that. 
And I say, let's say you're right. What do you expect to happen? That the Constitution will leap from its case at the <laughs> National Archives, fly over to the White House, and beat the president about the heads and shoulders until he changes his mind. No. These things happen, yes or no, up or down, because we allow them to happen. Because nobody has really protested in a significant way about the violation of the clause about the declaration of war, it doesn't really apply anymore. Presidents can send troops pretty much anywhere they want. And the people who, like in Congress, who are supposed to be protecting that prerogative, instead they're saying, President, send troops. Go ahead. You can do it. Why aren't you doing it? That's why it doesn't apply anymore. The Constitution didn't fail. We failed it in that regard. Let's hear from you. Questions for uh, Mr. Sagal. I'll start at the college in the fall. I have a broader question. Oh, my name is Dominic Surya. You, you start at the college in the fall? Yeah. You, you, so in the future, you will? This fall. This fall. So you're not yet a University no, of Chicago. You've got the look down, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> I, I work... You will fit I in. Work. Will he not... Not only, not only does he have the khakis and little sleeveless vest, he was first at the mic. You yeah, are going to thrive. I, you're going to thrive at this institution. I work at a turnaround middle school in the southwest side. And my okay. students never let me... Your question, please. Uh, my question... Um, as a Harvard grad and also as someone who does a lot with um, popular media, yes. do you find that you have to do more work to make your intellect accessible or to make your entertainment intellectual? Um, <laughs> here's the thing. I'm not that smart. <laughs> he, he was the man behind, or well, maybe the man behind the man, depending on the story behind uh, the sequel to Dirty Dancing, Dirty Dancing yeah. Havana Nights. So if that's any I'm basis... I'm really not that smart. No, yeah. here, here's the thing. I mean, um, my when we did this documentary, the reason I'm hosting it and not, say, somebody who knows what they're talking about, like, say, you, uh. is because we wanted this to be not some guy or woman looking at the camera and saying, this is how it works. We wanted some guy saying, I don't know how it works. I'm going to go find out. And when it gets explained to me, it'll get explained to you. So my gift that I was hired to use is I'm pretty ignorant. What I'm good at is talking about any topic, anything that you want for about a minute. <laughs> I can sound so, and this is how I got into Harvard, man. This yeah. is all you need. <laughs> University of Chicago, you have to be smart. Harvard, you can be clever. And I can, you, you name it, name it, mineralogy. I can do a minute on mineralogy. I'm schist, I'll say. <laughs> and you'll go, wow, he knows, for the first minute, you're like, he knows a little bit about mineralogy. And then after a minute, it's like, I don't know anything. <laughs> so that's why I'm good at Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, where we only talk about any, everything for a minute, and why I was good at this. Because I was like, oh, yeah, there's like an equal protection clause. I know about that. Now, you, expert, tell me the real stuff. So there you are. And I think that, to answer your question finally, that sort of translates into what I do for a living. Please. Hi, thank you. I'm Yang Yang Cheng, PhD candidate in physics. So I don't know whether I got my look right, but <laughs> 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 I would like to come, um, ask about um, last week when it was reported the IRS has been targeting um, nonprofit groups that are, um, and some of the key words they look for include constitution. and. Aside from what the, uh, the IRS's behavior, I would like to ask, while the Constitution lays the foundation for our government, is there or when did it start that certain groups of people would start touting the Constitution, however, it's bit, how, when, um, however it might be bits and pieces taken out of context? And this is associated with a deep, deep mistrust or even hatred of the government. Thank that you. is a really good question, and it, and, it, and it talks to an irony that's happened of late, which is that the Constitution has been, I won't say seized, but claimed by people with a particular political point of view. In this case, in recent years, it's a right-wing point of view, and it's a right-wing populist point of view. Uh, Richard Beeman, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who we've become very friendly, is a great guy, and he says, it, he, he, it's a great time to be a constitutional scholar. He's making a mint for the first time in his life because everybody wants to talk about the Constitution. And it's these Tea Party groups who have become convinced that the Obama administration in particular has exceeded in an 
unhistoric way, or rather in a historically new way, the bounds of the Constitution. And he says when he goes to speak to these Tea Party groups, he finds they know nothing about the Constitution. It's become a symbol of what they think we've lost. When they think about America as it is and they don't like it, they imagine that the America that once was, that they remember nostalgically, was the America of the Constitution. This is something else. And it is sad that, as you say, the IRS, in their, at the very least, unethical and unfair behavior of sort of targeting particular groups for scrutiny, used that as a keyword to look for. That is a sad state of affairs. Everybody should be talking about the Constitution. Everybody should claim the Constitution. Everybody who makes an argument in the political arena should claim the Constitution because by arguing in the political arena, you are making it real. I don't want to defend the IRS, but we should just be clear that we don't know for sure yet whether yeah. they, I mean, they did target these groups using these names, but we don't know whether their audits were disproportional. They may have gone after yeah. liberal advocacy groups using different mechanisms, well, but in well, any event, yeah. I agree with the sentiment. You are a lawyer. One of the things, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that's, that, that uh, is getting lost in the story is there's a lot of people uh, and organizations which are political advocacy groups, which are not technically um, allowed to be uh, exempt from taxes who are pretending to be non-profit. Yes. Um, what, would you call them? what would you call them? Not, not, uh, 501c4. Yeah, and it, it's, it's generally a scandal on left and right. And, yeah. and I have some personal experience with one of them, which I can tell you about if we have time. Hi, um, I'm Meg Lippincott. I'm at the University of Chicago Law School, and I have had the good fortune of taking constitutional law. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, I think something that legal scholars are particularly concerned about in constitutional law is the mootness of the amendment process. And something that Ruth Bader Ginsburg said when she was here this weekend is that she thinks young women should be concerned about getting the Equal Rights Amendment passed. Um, it seems to me like the amendment process was meant to be the forum for having debates over constitutional issues rather than the more organic kind of grassroots movements that you're talking about have evolved our notion and understanding of the Constitution. But you seemed a little bit disparaging of the amendment process. Um. In the documentary, we actually do a segment on the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. And the point we make is, I don't think it's in the, I don't know what episode it's in, you've seen all four, maybe you know, is basically I get into a boxing ring with the woman whose uh, name escapes me now, I'm sorry, who was the uh, first female gold medal winner in boxing at uh, the American gold winner winner. Um, and she hits, albeit my hands, <laughs> very hard. And the point that we were trying to make with that scene was the ERA, which was, I didn't know this, introduced in the 1920s and sort of simmered along in the political process for many years until it finally failed in the late 70s. Even though it failed, even though there is no amendment to the Constitution guaranteeing equal rights for women, women have come very far in achieving equal rights in very many legal arenas, one of which is Title IX and sports, which is why the example we were making. In fact, the single person who's probably most responsible for women achieving, let's say, getting much closer to true equality under law is Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she has been compared to Thurgood Marshall. What Thurgood Marshall did for African Americans, Ruth Bader Ginsburg did for women in the same way through persistent, careful, and strategic legal advocacy leading to key victories in the Supreme Court in key areas. And the point is, and this is, and, and, and if this comes across as disparaging the amendment process, uh, so be it, I don't think it is. I think that the amendment process was designed to be and should be a last resort and should be and is meant to be reserved for the mechanism of government. And most of the amendments we've had, with the significant exception of the Bill of Rights, are about the mechanism of government. When you're gonna have the inauguration, who succeeds the president, at what age you can vote, blah, blah, blah. Well, not blah, 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 it's really important. In general, I think the amendment process is a bad place to legislate, as I said before. It's too cumbersome. You can't get three quarters of the states to agree on something, but you can, through the normal political process, maybe get a House of Representatives together with a Senate and a president to pass a law and then allow the opponents in the due course of democratic processes to elect their own House, Senate, and President and undo it if they so see fit. And I think that's better for a democratic nation. Um, and I think that you can see, I mean, uh, the Lilly Ledbetter law is a great example. 
Supreme Court said, no, there's no protection uh, or there's an adequate protection in the Constitution for women under um, sex discrimination lawsuits and pay. So what happened? We elected a new Congress, a new Senate, a new president. They passed a law, and now it's fixed. I think that's how we're supposed to do things in most cases. Hi, my name is George Chung. Um, so this is a related question. If there is low level of awareness about the federal constitution, there's even a lower level on the state constitution. Uh, but unlike the federal, which is kind of more principles and values based, state constitutions have to deal with things, especially around redistricting, right. which is kind of uh, at the core of a lot of dysfunction in our country. Yes. So can you talk about at the state level, uh, given that it's also generally very difficult to amend state constitutions, how to raise awareness, how to use different ways of raising you know, uh, enough uh, political momentum to change something that is so incredibly insider uh, that most uh, insiders will just kind of throw rocks and say, it's just too complicated, don't vote for this. Um, I, will, I will try to be brief. Uh, one of the things that most people aren't aware of is most of the things that you pay attention to are the least relevant to your lives in terms of politics. If you watch MSNBC and Fox News and or all day, and they're talking about Benghazi, say, the topic of the moment, that is not nearly going to affect your life sitting here as much as what's happening in Springfield right now or what's happening at City Hall right now. And in general... We've all got to pay a lot more attention to what's happening locally because the government was designed to have a federal government, a state government, a local government, and, it, and as they get closer to you, they affect your life through political redistricting, through zoning, through licensing, through laws about who can sell caskets. And so in general, you know, turn off MSNBC and with, with the big fights happening and start paying attention to the Chicago Tribune or the Chicago Sometimes Statehouse Reporter because that's what's going to mess up with your life. Hello. Hello. So I am actually a, a member. I just wanted to say that, Mr. Sigal, that appreciate what you do, contributor. Um, I'm wondering. <laughs> touche, touche. Okay. So earlier you expressed some, um, I guess, appreciable degree of frustration with, and actually this is a good segue. So we didn't plan this, but a, uh, you were frustrated with sort of the population at large's ignorance, I guess, uh, where the Constitution is concerned. Uh, clearly, it's very important. I'm wondering, and I guess maybe as a function of how the architects designed it, and maybe because there's so many of us here now and this constitution is expected to kind of wrangle all of us. Um, it's, I mean, the, the question is, it seems to be working. Here we are, you know, 60 some odd years after desegregation with a uh, public sort of uh, dialogue that's trending toward, and even a, a national policy, it's trending toward equal rights for homosexuals. Um, I'm wondering where ignorance of the Constitution enters into the calculus, because it seems like it's working at large, if you were... Well, here's the... Th and, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm being told I need to be brief, but this is what I found out. Most people in America, at least people I talked to and the people I heard about, don't know a lot about the Constitution, but they, man, they believe in it. And the analogy I come up with is, say, a really committed Christian who doesn't know his Bible, but understands that in general you're supposed to be good to each other, you're supposed to do right, you're not supposed to lie. And you're like, okay, you may not know what Thessalonians 2 says, but you know that and that's pretty good. Similarly with the Constitution, people may not know what Article 1 is about or Article 2 is about, they may not know the text of the amendments, but they know that we are a democratic country where we follow the law, even if we don't like it, that everybody gets to vote, that, the peop that we have elections and the elections have to be respected, that if you have a dispute with your neighbor, you take him to court, you don't go over with an ax, and that's what keeps the country going. This general, I mean, we went to this, um, you know, uh, citizenship uh, ceremony in Chicago in the federal building, <laughs> and you went, you didn't do so well on the, qu I'm just, you know. I know, I'm sorry. For a guy who does trivia I for a living. didn't do so well, but we went to the citizenship ceremony where, and there was people from 40 countries. And they spoke, God knows, probably even more languages, because some countries have more than one language. And they were all here, and they were really excited to be Americans, and they are now all Americans. What binds them together? This civic belief, this religion, almost, of politics, that we are a nation of law, that we will, that we will respect each other under law, that we have liberties that can't be violated, that we will solve our differences peacefully, if angrily. And so I think that's why we get along. Knowledge isn't as important as you might think as a general belief in the general outlines of the system. Bush versus Gore might, you didn't, you just not in the piece, not but Bush the versus piece. Gore might be a, a great example. I mean, Al Gore saying in a recent interview, 
look, I, I thought they were stealing the election, but that's just not the way we roll here. We respect the Supreme Court. The, the, the jo- that, the jo- an amazing act. The really. joke he made on our show was I did some research, and it turns out there's really no, there's no middle way between accepting the decision and having troops in the streets. Yeah. So. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm a first-year public policy major in the college. And um, I just had a question about sort of the last thing you were talking about before the questions began about um, how people sort of really need to be involved with the Constitution that it's not going to leap out of its case and sort of yeah. protect itself. Um, and I was just wondering, after doing sort of this documentary going around America, um, do you have a sense of optimism that people want to do that, want to get engaged in civics? Or is it sort of, oh, crap, these people don't know anything? People tend to get really involved in things that affect them. Um, and I wish that more people would do that because that's how it starts. I mean, the classic example is, you know, the, the whole civil rights movement started because Rosa Parks didn't want to give up her bus seat. And that turns out to be sort of a myth. She was an activist who wanted to be a test case. But that's the idea. That's how great things started. People should pay more attention to what is affecting them in the moment and affecting their lives than what the ye- yelling people on TV is telling them is important. And if you can do that, then I think all of a sudden our civic engagement will start. Well, Peter has done us all a uh, and the nation an incredible service by giving us excellent, excellent content in a very accessible format with Monty Python style graphics and lots of humor, <laughs> lots of very poignant moments. It made me smile. I learned some things. I cried. It was better than cats. No. Um, <laughs> It is, it is tremendous, so I encourage you all to, uh, to, to tune in and learn something about our wonderful Constitution, and please help me thank Peter for uh, coming tonight. Thank you.